Okay. <clears throat> One quick second, and I'll be ready to go. Okay, I'm ready to open it all up if you all are. Yes, sir. Okay, are we on? I don't hear anyone or anything. Are, are, are we on? I, I, yes, you are. Okay, we're, on. We're, we're on. Okay, we're good morning, good. everyone. Good morning, all. Thank you. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for dialing in. Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, and welcome to the virtual Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and River Committee. This is our regular hearing. I am joined by uh, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Vice Chair uh, Mark Ridley-Thomas, uh, Paul Coretz, Kevin DeLeon, and Paul Krikorian. Uh, before I turn it over to our clerk to call the roll, I'd like to remind everyone to make sure that they are on mute when not speaking. Uh, Mr. Villanueva, if you could please call the roll. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Council Member Mitchell Farrell? Present. Council Member Mark Ridley-Thomas? Here. Council Member Paul Coretz? Present. Council Member Kevin DeLeon? Council Member Paul Kikorian? Here. You have a quorum, sir. Thank you, Mr. Vinoy. Uh, uh, in a moment, uh, we will take up to an hour to hear from members of the public who wish to comment on items specific to the agenda and one minute for general public comment. I'll turn it over to our city attorney to set the speaking rules to the members of the public who are calling in and to our city clerk to provide the necessary information for the public to dial in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To members of the public calling in, when it is your turn to speak, please state which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute per item to speak, up to two minutes total, and one minute for general public comment. We will tell you when your time is up. <clears throat> when speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on a specific agenda item, you will get one brief warning from me or the chair. If you do not immediately clearly get on topic or again stray off topic, the chair will cut you off and you will forfeit the rest of your speaking time and we will move on to the next speaker. We will take up to one hour total of public comment today. Please press star nine to request to speak. As soon as you're here, someone address you on the phone, please press star six and state your name and state which agenda items you would like to speak on. We know the situation is not ideal and thank you for your cooperation as we do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Mr. Villanueva. Members of the public who would like to offer a public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call one 254 5252. Again, the number is 1 669 254 5252. And use meeting ID number 160 919 4459. Again, the meeting ID number is 160 919 4459. And then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Thank you, Mr. Villanueva. Uh, we are ready for our first caller. Caller with the phone number ending in 9831. Please press star 6 to unmute. State your name and what items you would like to speak on. My name is Catherine Ronan, and I'd like to speak on item number two and general public comment. All right, you have one minute for each. Please go ahead. I am an LADWP customer and a volunteer with the Sierra Club. As LADWP and the City Council translate the findings from the NREL study into a concrete plan to generate 100% clean energy using renewables, 
I hope you will keep in mind the following priorities. We are in a climate emergency, so we must take aggressive action to reach 100% clean energy. The LA LEADS scenario shows that 2035 is a feasible date. Let's shoot for that. We should not rely on renewable energy credits or the burning of biofuels if we want truly clean energy. The LA LEADS scenario is good in that respect. I realize that the LA LEADS scenario is more expensive than the others, but there isn't enough information presented to be able to analyze why that is and what kinds of costs those are. Are the investments in infrastructure that can be repaid over many years? Climate change and air pollution disproportionately affect low-income communities and communities of color. These communities need to be prioritized and lead the way to a clean energy future. For instance, fossil fuel burning plants in these communities should be the first to shut down or convert to renewables. Let's prioritize programs such as demand response and investments in energy efficiency that lower energy consumption, especially at peak times. Let's also prioritize local distributed energy production and storage, which is more reliable and resilient than energy imported from outside the LA Basin and can also create good local jobs for engineers. I hope that LADWP will involve and partner with the LA community in implementing these solutions. I realize that LADWP has already made some major positive progress in the direction of 100% clean energy. And I hope that LA will continue to lead the way. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Caller with the phone number ending in 0492. Please press star six to unmute. State your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, my name is Ethan Spencer from Food and Water Action, and I'd like to speak on uh, item uh, number two and general public comment. Okay, you have one minute for each. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Council members, and I want to thank you for your urgency on scheduling this. Um, I think what's happening across the rest of the country right now is as clear of an indication as ever that we need to be Texas radically transforming crazy. how we power and hello? You're dying there. People are dying. Oh, my apologies. Sorry, I, don't I, have my... Over? I blew it. Yeah, go ahead. Right. I, didn't... I wasn't on sorry, no, my sorry about that. So I think, like you were saying, I think what's happening across the rest of the country right now is as clear of an indication as ever that we need to be radically transforming how we power and manage our energy system. Crucially, it means switching out fossil fuels for clean energy and avoiding false solutions that would continue to prop up gas, like uh, biogas and renewable energy credits. Um, but we need to be looking even more fundamental than that. Um, it isn't just enough to swap out one fuel source for another. We need to transform how our communities actually use energy. In order for our communities to transform, they need to be given the support, resources, and power in order to thrive. That sort of change requires a transformation of how LATWP functions as an institution. Our utility can't just be thinking about how it can supply power to communities. It needs to be thinking how it can partner with communities to help them literally take control over their own energy. Uh, the truth is real solutions are built on the local level. They're built by engaging person to person, house to house, neighborhood to neighborhood, through smart thermostats, energy efficient appliances, rooftop solar, battery storage, all of which can help build resiliency, lower demand, and help keep bills low, even as the price of energy rises. It's built through green jobs and new opportunities that ratepayers can see right there in their community. And in order to do that, LADWP can't think of itself in a silo. It can't think of itself as a business. It needs to think of itself as a partner. It needs to think how it can partner with the community and organizations that know how to connect with them, partner with the rest of the city's departments and determine how our move to clean energy can build off of and support the rest of our climate plans, partner with the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office, an office that is designed to ensure that all our initiatives towards climate justice are not just coordinated, but are being led by the needs and experiences of those on the front line of the climate emergency, black, brown, indigenous communities, workers, youth. That shift in power it goes beyond just energy and LGWP. It includes racial justice, housing justice, transportation justice. Thank you. Thank These you, Caller. That, require... Yeah, thank you so minutes. much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next caller, please. 
Call her with the phone number ending in 5347. Please press star 6 to unmute. State your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, my name is Rachel Smith. I'm looking to speak on public comment and agenda item number two. All right, you have one minute. For Thank you, council members, for your commitment to lasting climate reform. I am a LA DWP customer and member of the Sunrise Movement, speaking today to urge you to act now in your response to the LA 100 survey. First, you must recognize that too many of the pathways mapped out by the survey work towards a clean energy system by 2045, a date that is 15 years past the deadline scientists say we must stick to. We are barely into 2021, and just these past six months have been filled with wildfires, extreme amounts of snowfall, snowstorms, and the freeze in Texas. As a former Texan myself, uh, I give this comment as my own parents don't have power and are sharing a small space heater in their bedroom. My grandparents had to ev evacuate their home. And even these stories seem lighthearted compared to the devastation in other areas. If you don't act now and with urgency, you are no different than Texas politicians ignoring their constituents' cries for help. Some of the so-called solutions presented in the survey are not actually legitimate, specifically biogas and renewable energy credits. Both of these false solutions are pushed by the oil and gas industry and must be stopped. Biogas only further incentivizes factory farms, and these farms will only continue to depend on government subsidies to continue leaking methane into the air and water of marginalized communities. Renewable energy credits are something I am frankly astounded still exists. These, this is yet another way for cities to pretend they are helping when instead they are continuing to underserve and harm marginalized communities that have been left defenseless for decades. I also want to add that the number of people speaking today represent a small fraction of concerned citizens who also want the 2030 deadline. I know the solution will take extreme measures that might take people out of their comfort zones, but I would much rather deal with unprecedented policy than continued unprecedented natural disasters. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Caller with the phone number ending in 3447. Please press star 6 to unmute. What items you would like to speak on? Yes, um, my name is David Hockey. I'm, I'd like to speak on item number two regarding the LA100 study on how LADWP can achieve 100% renewable electricity. Okay, one um, minute. Honorable, thank you. Honorable members of the LA City Council's Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and River Committee. My name is David Hockey. I'm chair of the Sierra Club's Angeles Chapters Clean Break Team, which is advocating for a just transition from dirty fossil fuels to a clean renewable energy future. I'm also chair of the LA County Clean Power Alliance's Community Advisory Committee. I'm speaking today to advocate for democratization of energy. LADWP customers deserve a democratized energy future that engages customers in local solutions that create good paying high road jobs, thereby, thereby reinvigorating the communities that LADWP was created to serve. This will create a more resilient grid and more resilient communities. This can be done by prioritizing local programs such as demand response and energy efficiency, investments that lower energy consumption, especially during peak demand. Thank you. Local Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 4005. Please press star six to unmute. State your name and what items you would like to speak on. Lisa Mescla with the Sierra Club on items one and two. All right. Uh, you have uh, two minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair and Council members. Uh, first, I want to state support for item one on your agenda and urge your approval. The feed entire program under the Clean Grid LA umbrella will build a local clean energy with storage that we need to meet our short-term clean energy targets and enhance local resiliency, reliability, and create good jobs. Secondly, I'm looking forward to the presentation today by LADVP and NREL to the committee on the 100% renewable study that has been in the works for years. 
Um, as a member of the advisory group, I'm excited to see the study being finalized. And it's really the only study we have seen, not just in the state, but the country, that is looking at how we are really going to make a 100% renewable grid work. Uh, we would like to extend our appreciation to the council, uh, who helped make sure the study became a priority, and to now Council Member DeLeon, who led the way through SB 100 and putting the whole state on a similar pathway. I know that there's a lot of interest in this study from the public, and I'm looking forward to the various ways our members can plug in so that we can continue working together to not only accelerate our timeline, as many folks spoke today, to achieve a clean energy future that is not only meeting the moment that the climate crisis requires, but we also have a clean energy economy that can safeguard affordability, foster public health and economic benefits for the region, and making sure we can keep the lights on. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 7008. Please press star 6 to unmute. It's your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hello, um, my name is Julio Rodriguez, and I'd like to uh, request two minutes, one for a general public comment and one for agenda item two. You got it. Two minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Council, for um, your urgency and commitment to transformative climate action. Um, I'd like to say that we have to, it's vital that we hit the 2030 deadline that scientists say is needed to avert climate crisis. Each time I go hiking, um, especially when there wasn't rain for a considerable amount into the winter, I was afraid um, of coming back the next day and seeing it completely like altered by a fire. Um, I'm afraid of the my, my cousins and not being able to take them into the mountains and um, what kind of world they're going to live in. We have to um, look at the... Um, there is a study by Synapse Energy Economics that was sent by the Food and Water Watch in their comment for today's meeting that shows how we can get to 100% um, renewable energy by 2030. And so I really question what we are waiting for. Um, we have to get there, and I want, I'd like you all to ask yourself what you stand to lose and, what you stand, and who you stand to lose, and also what you stand to gain by um, switching to renewable energy. Um, thank you. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 2780. Please press star six to unmute. State your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, my name is Lisa Hart and I'd like to speak on item number two and make a general comment. Okay, you have one minute for each. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm with the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance. Uh, we have 62 member neighborhood councils. In 2016, the Alliance took a position in support of 100% renewable energy by 2030. And in 2019, about 40 neighborhood councils across the city weighed in in support of this study. Although, unfortunately, I don't see that reflected on your agenda. Uh, we continue to ask that we as a city move as quickly as we can toward clean, renewable energy. And just so you know, our energy committee really, really, really hates biogas. Um, we're meeting, we're hosting a meeting that is open to anybody this Sunday via Zoom on the study and plan to host another meeting once the study results are released. And we hope to continue this conversation with you. I think we all know that the city and the Department of Water and Power are facing a huge challenge and also have a real opportunity to engage with residents on what the future looks like. And we really look forward to working with you on this. I'm excited to see what the future will bring, and I hope it isn't too late. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with a phone number ending in 8639. Please press star 6 to unmute. Item you would like to speak on. Hi, my name is Matt Wade. I'd like to speak on item number two in general public comment. All right, you have uh, one minute for each, Matt. I uh, thank you. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Ground Game LA, and um, we just wanted to uh, emphasize that LADWP needs to be working 
a lot more on building deep ties to the community to help reach the climate goals. Um, we've done that successfully this past year with our mutual aid program. Um, a lot of the programs we'd like to see expanded at LA DWP, um, such as programs that help make people make their homes more energy efficient, for example, are not benefiting disadvantaged communities at the same rate as wealthier communities. So studies are showing that affluent LA neighborhoods use more neighborhoods, more energy, and reach greater benefits from government incentive programs that aim to help rate payers save money. So the LADWP is not communicating and meeting the needs of these disadvantaged communities in their outreach. Um, so the uh, Empower program by LADWP recruited local community organiz organizers, excuse me, organizations to go door to door, helping sign up residents for LADWP county and utility spoke. Uh, sponsored programs. So LADWP really needs to start seeing this part of it, this kind of partnership as essential to meeting its clean energy goals instead of having a bunch of very difficult to sign up for and find programs that have all kinds of different rules um, and restrictions. It's very difficult uh, for people who are in impacted communities to use these programs. Um, we need to see the kind of outreach um, that they've done in the past and uh, work on building tie, uh, ties with community organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in 7004. Please press star six to unmute. Set your name and what items you would like to speak on. Hi, my name is Amanda Pantoja and I'd like to make general public comment and speak on item number two. All right, you have one minute for each. Please go ahead. I will. Uh, first, I want to thank the committee for putting the LA 100 study on its agenda. It is telling of the committee's commitment to act on climate issues with the urgency that it deserves. Um, I'm an organizer with Food and Water Watch, and right now it's undeniable that we're seeing some of the very real impacts of climate crisis unravel. So this is why I believe that the LA 100 study is so important. It gives the opportunity to address the climate crisis locally and also provides us with the tools to come together and decide the climate energy pathways we want to implement towards healthier, safer communities. And I emphasize the we because I'm here making public comment virtually alongside other climate activists clean energy advocates and community leaders of LA to express how important it is that we transition to 100% clean energy by 2030. It's when the decision comes down in front of the committee on a pathway forward that gives us the best chance to stop the climate crisis. It's the people that are most impacted, marginalized, and oppressed who will be the ones that lead. And despite all that's occurred this past year, our power has already transformed LA for the better. And is only expected to grow stronger. So I ask that also the city do more than simply invest in clean energy. It must also invest in its people. By empowering its ratepayers as clean energy leaders, the city will not only reduce emissions, it will also create green jobs, healthier air and climate, and provide the real solutions that we need for a just recovery. And my final ask is for the committee to listen to their constituents. I will say that, frankly, being given just one week right before a three-day weekend was not the best way to engage community members on this issue. And given the time we had to go about this, you know, community members still came out to speak out. So going forward, we want to be working with you so that your constituents engagement and um, for the committee members to continue to actively weigh in again and again on the um, LA 100 and our clean energy pathways. Our movement is only growing thank stronger you, and we really need thank to you. That, that, Your time is up, but thank you for your comments. Next caller. Uh, and before we go oh. to the, just to remind everyone who's calling to make sure and, and press star nine uh, to request to speak. Uh, thank you. Next caller. Caller with the phone number ending in 9017, please press star 6 to unmute. State your name and what items you would like to speak on. Morning, Council. My name is Francis. I'm with the Sierra Club's My Generation campaign, and I'm an LAD LADWP customer. I'd like to speak on item 2 and general comment. All right. One minute for each. Please go ahead. Sounds good. 
So we already know that we're in the climate crisis. This is why this committee is formed. This is why the LA 100 study is happening. And we're also seeing nationwide, specifically in Texas, the repercussions. California is getting ready for another heat wave coming up in the summer, which means that we're going to be facing more wildfires, which means we're going to be facing more blackouts. And we already all know this. And so I'll just get to the chase. We have been anticipating this 100 study for a really long time. And we're only we're disappointed to find that there's only one study that gets close to meeting our climate and environmental goals. In other words, of all the work that we've been presented, we can only support the LA lead scenario because everything else dismisses the urgency and desperation of our situation. Having said that, we need to keep that target date of 2035. Um, 2045 is too late to avoid all the severe impacts of climate change. Even President Biden has called for a national tar target of 2035. So LADWP should really be that statewide and national leader that you'd like to call yourselves to adopt a more aggressive timeline than the minimum required by SB 100. That means, of course, we need to eliminate all fossil fuels. That means any natural gas uh, means biofuels. You already know how we feel about that. We can't use any more carbon credits because then we just continue to perpetuate the pollute to or the pay to pollute. Um, and we need to really prioritize energy democracy, which includes prioritizing local programs such as demand response and energy efficiency, prioritizing local distributed energy production and storage, and as always, modernizing our very, very, very old electrical grid. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the phone number ending in three two three four. Please press star six to unmute. State your name and what items you would like to speak on. Good morning. My name is Jasmine Vargas. I would like to speak on item one two and general comment. All right. You have uh, two minutes for your for your items and one minute for general public comment. Thank you so much, Councilmember Ophel. And thank you uh, for having this conversation today. The 100% study that LADWP has been a part of has been going on for long enough. And we are expecting action and decisions that will reverberate across the decades happening this year. So your leadership is going to be instrumental. Um, I also uh, want to say that I'm with Food and Water Watch. Uh, I'm a senior organizer, and I have been part of the LA 100 Advisory Group, which is a group that um, that advises and, and, and meets with both the uh, NREL and LA Department of Water and Power. And the entire time I've been part of that advisory group, I've been I've been demanding and I've been asking and I've been insisting that there be a community process involved, uh, a community process that genuinely engages the people in L.A. that will ultimately be the ones that make this happen. The people in L.A. will be the ones in the job setting up and upgrading the, the transmission lines. The people in L.A. will be the ones creating the energy on their solar panels. The people of L.A., and the jobs that are to be created, the industry that is to be harnessed here is going to be us. So you need to think about this uh, long term. That's what this is asking you to do. Not just, and, and think about this as a way of getting out of the pandemic through a just recovery. Um, this is the question in front of you. Are we going to go from crisis to crisis to crisis? Or are we going to actually use what we have and get us out of the crisis? So I invite you to think about this this way because ultimately, number one on the agenda today is how we're going to replace 1,600 megawatts of gas in basin before 2030. We should be thinking about getting rid of all that gas by 2030. We also are going to be talking about the the study, which is going to say this is going to be too expensive. You need to think about the benefits and the job creation and the opportunities for righting the wrongs of environmental racism. What you have here today is a moment that is history is calling on you. And it's also asking you to make this just and equitable. 
It's asking you to listen to the people, the people that own LADWP, because of, this is a municipal utility. And if we could do it here, we can show the world that we can do it everywhere. I think that's what this moment is calling on you. And I thank you again for your time and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller uh, with the unknown number, please press star six to unmute. State your name. Yeah. I'd like to speak on. Yeah. All right. One, two, nine, a general public comment. Okay. Uh, two, uh, two minutes for the items and one minute for general. Yeah. See Kevin Bailey on? He won. Mitchell Farrell runs a fair meeting, unlike you do at 2 p.m. Now, we have renewable energy. Now, there's the truth. All the environmental lobbyists are calling. Edison gives you $33.70 global solution credit every six months. They're on renewables. Is it? Yeah. But DWP lies to everybody. But the nice, pretty lady, Cynthia McQueen Hill, she's trying to undo all the corruption on the board of DWP pigs. Yeah. As soon as the, this buzzer goes, let's just cut him off. So. No, no, no. No, don't do that. I want to talk about energy and DWP. Can I do that? Thank you. Well, we support number one with one modification that you give every customer of DWP the global solution credit that you've been stealing for 40 fiscal years and backdate it. That's about seventy-four twenty-five per residential customer per unit. Right, Kevin DeLeon? Well, well, that's right. When I was in Sacramento, I helped the DWP swindle everybody out of the bank. That's correct. Yeah. And then item number two, look at Texas. 100% renewables, and it frees up, and they don't have any energy. Then the wind blows, and then they turn the grid off so the power poles don't fall down. That's because they're up in the air rather than down on the ground, like Ventura County mandated in 1990. Ground-powered utilities, no more overhead. But you guys didn't do that. Why not? Well, because... They paid off the city council to keep being allowed to do overhead power line construction. Yay! So that's what we're dealing with. And that's why Kevin was speaking up, interrupting, and getting a little testy. But don't worry about it. Join us at 2 o'clock when Jimmy Gomez will give us all free energy. When we bring 49 million more people here to the United States with not okay, enough of water and electricity. Thank you. Next caller, please. Caller with the unknown number, please press star six to unmute. Caller with the unknown number, please press star six to unmute. Caller with the unknown number, please press star six to unmute. State your name and what items you would like to speak on. It appears we don't actually have a caller there. Identify yourself or we're going to have to go to the next caller. Mr. Okay. Chair, no more speakers in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that concludes public comment, uh, and uh, I, I want to thank everyone for who called in for your passion about the environment. Uh, that's why we scheduled this item. Uh, we share that passion, and we are very eager to move forward 
uh, with this report and other environmental uh, issues. Uh, so uh, I'd like to now, uh, colleagues, uh, move on uh, to item uh, one. Uh, if you could please read the item, Mr. Prieto. Certainly, Mr. Chair, members. Item number one relates to DWP and city attorney reports and ordinance relative to amending the ad code to permit the DWP to enter into contracts to purchase local re renewable energy as part of the Feed and Tariff Plus program. We have staff from DWP representing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, what we have for us uh, is the Clean Grid LA Feed and Tariff Plus pilot plan. Uh, which is uh, aimed at determining the optimal business strategy and processes required to facilitate a broader uh, local distributed energy resource deployment model that's beneficial to LADWP's electric system infrastructure and, importantly, ratepayers. Uh, the pilot program will add up to 10 megawatts of distributed energy resources through a competitive bidding process. Uh, as Mr. Prieto mentioned, we have the Department of Water and Power here to go over this uh, program in more detail. So uh, uh, as soon as your symbols are ready to go, please introduce yourselves and uh, let's uh, begin the report. Thank you. Arash? So thank you, uh, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Jason Rondu. I'm the director of Clean Grid LA at LADWP. And I'm joined uh, with uh, Arash Sadi, who manages our distributed resource development group. So we're very excited to bring this uh, proposal to you. Um, and uh, I'll give a little bit of a background, and then Arash will give a summary of the, the elements of this pilot and the significance uh, of this pilot as well. So just as some background, uh, LA, DWP, and, and the city of LA continues to lead in solar and distributed resources. We've maintained... Uh, the number one ranking for a city in the country uh, for five of the last six years. And that's due in large part by our approach to local solar. You know, there's not one particular program that solves all of the issues that we're trying to solve. Uh, we've approached this from a portfolio perspective where we've got net metering. Uh, we recently approved a virtual net metering uh, pilot. Um, we have a growing portfolio of community solar programs uh, as well. And that's really resulted in nearly 500 megawatts of local solar, again, more than any other uh, city in the country. Um, no single program solves grid needs, addresses equity, and provides the power that we need. Again, this is about a portfolio approach. Um, this particular program, the Feed and Tariff Plus program, builds on the existing Feed and Tariff program that we have today. We have um, nearly uh, 200 megawatts of uh, existing feed and tariff projects that have been built and projects that are in process. Um, no other program has expanded that to include storage as well in a way that considers grid needs and prioritizes uh, disadvantaged communities. So I'd like to hand it off to Raj to give a summary of the program elements and, and our approach to designing this program. So Raj, would you um, go ahead and, and give us a summary? Yes. Uh, good morning, esteemed council members. Uh, as Jason alluded, uh, this is a programmatic approach that will um, eventually uh, be a much part, part of a larger portfolio. And so with FIT Plus, um, the idea was to uh, utilize existing uh, megawatt capacity that was pre-approved by our board as well as the council. Um, so we, we started off with 10 megawatts of capacity from the existing approved 200 megawatts. Um, our focus was how do we uh, create... Um, uh, resiliency opportunities while addressing grid needs. And so we've essentially focused on development zones uh, within the city, three specific, uh, South LA, the Northeast Valley, and then the West LA zone. And those zones were based truly on the grid needs and um, to address resiliency and some of the reliability needs we've seen. Additionally, we were trying to figure out ways that we can um, focus uh, equitably the development of these types of projects. So priority enrollment will actually be provided to the disadvantaged communities um, so that we can encourage equity development. So those two zones I mentioned initially, the South LA and Northeast Valley, fall into disadvantaged communities as defined in SBU 535. And then the other focus was competition. 
And this is something that the rate payer advocate had brought up on past occasions and we finally heeded the call. So to that point, with the help of uh, the RPA's uh, office, we were able to figure out a way to develop these projects in a competitive manner. So that not only meant we could actually achieve the least cost and the best fit uh, projects for the city and the rate payers, but we're actually addressing multiple needs. And this is a value stack uh, approach that we took here. So we're able to also leverage in some cases, additional energy storage incentives to make these projects much more competitive than traditionally seen. And then lastly, scalability. I think anything we, we do is we're always trying to figure out ways to pilot a program, which is sometimes the most difficult. But once you get to a point where you can get those lessons learned and see the successful uh, outcomes and, and obviously uh, obtain you know, a cost-effective approach, we, we intend to come back at some point and um, you know, pr propose a scaling of this program so that we can address much larger needs within the city. And so with that, I open it up to questions. Uh, thank you, Rosh, and thank you, Jason. Um, a couple of quick questions. Uh, for, first is in relation to uh, the timeline of the project and possible renewal. Um, what, uh, what details do you have for that? Yes. So the way we've um, structured this program is once the projects are given essentially the green light, we expect them to come online within 12 months, uh, possibly sooner. So I think once we get a, um, probably a, a batch of projects that have come through, we have a, a, an understanding of pricing, some of the uh, issues that may have been encountered as a result of turning those on, we can come back to both the board and the council, give you a full report of where we stand, and then present the uh, you know decision of where we go next. But ideally, you know, the plan is there's there's a lot more need out there. And so I think the intention is let's get this right. Let's hit, hit the low low hanging fruit and come back and start um, going after the, the bigger uh, piece of the pie. Great. So the the, pro, the pilot projects will continue uh, until you report back to council. So they're not going to uh, sunset and then end. Funding. Uh, what's the funding source uh, for for the these pi the pilot projects? The good news is we've already secured approvals for that funding, or aka the runway for this. Um, we've already uh, received that approval it was in late December of 2019, and I believe council approved in early 2020. So we're not asking for additional funding. All we're doing is essentially taking megawatts that were not being used and saying let's repurpose them for purposes of. Uh, you know, including solar and storage on the same site and provide resiliency for those customers. So there's multiple benefits. And, and I'll add, uh, Rosh worked very closely with the self-generation incentive program to find out how we can design this program to unlock existing rebates uh, to, in order to bring the cost of this program down and give the ratepayers a better a uh, better bang for their bucks. So that was work that was done, groundwork that was done ahead of time in order to make sure we could take advantage of that. Terrific. Uh, it's a, an exciting era in which to uh, create these pilot projects as well because I have a feeling we can expect some exciting things from uh, from our federal government at this point and the administration. So so this it's great that we're so dialed in. Uh, a question, you, you kind of covered this, but in terms of what are some of the significant metrics that will inform the success of this project? Yes, so a couple of the metrics that stand out to us is we want to see development in the equitable uh, zones in LA. Um, again, namely the Northeast Valley and in South LA. Um, so that's one area. The other thing is we want to make sure that these systems are capable of providing resiliency. So when the grid goes down, these facilities will essentially start feeding back into those customers um, critical loads per se. And then the other item is we want to see, um, uh, you know, high participation and competitive pricing along the way. And the idea is if we can show there's a strong demand for this, that builds another case for coming back to our board and eventually council for um, a much more robust program that addresses the other needs that we're seeing within the, within the city. And again, it's, 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 it's key to get a distribution of these projects throughout the city and not centralize everything in one area. So ideally, 
uh, resource uh, geographic di diversity is what we're looking for. Thank you. So, so I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm hearing that when there is a, a heat event, for example, and we lose power, um, are you hoping or even expecting or building the resiliency so that those systems that are down in these two pilot project areas can bounce back and we can get the energy back on more quickly? Yeah, so, so the idea is these will essentially create nano grids, right? So it, it allows those facilities to ride through some of those outages. Um, this is actually a selling point. So a lot of customers who maybe traditionally wouldn't wouldn't participate in the feed and tariff program, having Fit Plus now opens that door to them because it's worth their time to invest the capital and also open up their facilities to development of, of these types of projects. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, questions? Mr. Ridley Thomas, you're first. I'm, I'm here to uh, do as the chair wishes. It, it's you. Uh, may I take the opportunity to commend DWP and uh, their partners in this um, uh, rather extraordinary un undertaking, uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues. You made that point uh, quite clear, uh, Mr. Chair. I want to uh, affirm that. Uh, you might I say that it's forward thinking. Um, I think it's comprehensive. Um, and I think we need to uh, do what we need to do to pay uh, as much attention to moving this forward as we possibly uh, can. And so I just wanted to uh, park there for a moment, Mr. Chair, and move. Uh, forward uh, with the acknowledgement of that which has been uh, communicated so far. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ridley Thomas. And I believe Mr. Koretz was. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm so pleased that this pilot project is moving forward because we need more distributed generation around the city. Um, wondering if DWP could tell us how successful our past competitive bidding programs like. Fit 50 and lock fit were in this regard, and uh, how we can improve on them in this pilot. Yeah, I, I can uh, jump on that, Narash. If, you, if you've got more to add, please do. The fundamental challenge that we're trying to solve for is we know that we're going to need to continue to grow local DG, and you'll see that in the presentation for LA 100. Uh, under all the scenarios, we need a lot more local solar. There's a premium for local solar. So we have to strike the balance between getting this quickly, but getting it at as good a price as we possibly can. So when we launched the feed and tariff program a number of years ago, back in 2012, we launched it with a competitive component. There were some successes. We got some low cost projects. Then there were some, you know, failures, some really, you know, underbids, you know, projects that didn't, you know, work out well. We also launched the program with a set price and we did the fit 50, as you referenced the competitive piece. We've had successes with, you know, both scenarios, but with the competitive piece, you always, you know, run into the possibility where you have some potential underbidding and the project cannot come to fruition. This is the importance of the pilot with the FIT program when we did the pilot in 2012. We had those challenges, but once we figured that out, had the lessons learned, as Arash mentioned, we were able to scale it pretty quickly, and we brought that up to 150 megawatts and made that available, and that program is really, you know, humming now. Same thing with this program. There's there's a very high likelihood that there are some challenges and some lessons learned along the way, and we've shown over and over that we can course correct and make improvements. So, yeah, there, there certainly will be challenges, uh, but that's the beauty of this. Once we get this off the ground, once we learn those lessons, we can scale it. Very good. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Kretz. Mr. De Leon, I believe you had something, uh, and or uh, Mr. Kretz. Yeah, you're there. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, appreciate it. A um, couple questions um, for for Jason and, and Raj. Um, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I, I think we would all agree that uh, our grid is pretty outdated, and we don't have demand response unlike many other California cities. So, actually, we have a we actually have a ways to go. 
that's that's our reality. Um, we should be number one. Uh, it's all relative. I agree with the fact that the size of our, our, our rent payers as well as we have so much sunshine uh, in Los Angeles. So a, a couple questions, you know, just straightforward. Um, do you have a map breaking down the uh, DG uh, uh, energy across the city? Can you share that with me in my office that breaks it down by zip code? Yes, uh, uh, Council Member, we, we certainly have that information. Uh, we update it periodically, and that helps us inform where we try to prioritize enrollment in programs such as these. Um, there are, you know, obviously, when it comes to distributed resource programs, it often requires a co-investment. And when you have that scenario, you introduce the challenge of inequities, where folks that have capital, that have money, can enroll in programs. And we saw that with the net metering program. And so what we did shortly thereafter is we adjusted our net metering program to add additional incentives into areas that had low solar penetration that had a significant overlap with disadvantaged communities. So we were able to use those maps and that data to make adjustments to programs to encourage that. We've taken those lessons learned and done the same thing with demand response. Uh, we have the thermostat program that was launched, launched last summer where we did targeted advertising to areas that had lower investment in distributed resources. And the same approach is taken with our virtual net metering pilot that we just uh, uh, got approved recently by our board. And with this uh, feed and tariff plus program, we're using the same lesson learned. So yes, we can certainly provide that information to you in your office. No, that, thank you, Jason. That'd be fantastic. Uh, through the chair, just a couple more questions. I think it's segueing, it's a, it's a nice segue, uh, Jason. Uh, I think it's safe to assume that the solar panels per capita obviously are in, in much more affluent neighborhoods, uh, to your point. And I think you know, universally, uh, given the, the lack of access to capital uh, for uh, a large group of, of, of Angelinos. Um, what incentive plans and outreach are you deploying to remedy uh, that inequity that exists with DG and obviously those who have access to the latest and greatest and most innovative and greenest technologies in comparison to those who don't? And, and if, it, if it, I don't want you to, if it's a long answer, that's okay. You know, you can give me an answer also offline too. But uh, what, what remedies do we have or should we be deploying uh, to, to deal with the, the inequities right now? Yeah, uh, what I can do is give you kind of a, a short version of the answer, but we could also include a summary of that when we provide the, the data on where uh, investments in DG goes. So the short answer is um, when we developed the community solar programs, we've got a couple of them. We've got one where LADWP goes out and installs solar on rooftops. We also have a virtual community solar program as well. And what we did is we developed those programs and then designed our outreach around targeting communities that have had lower participation in distributed resource. And that is based on historical participation in net metering, which again, a lot of that investment went into communities that had a single family home, that had extra capital that could make that co investment. So we looked at where the solar wasn't and we targeted those areas. So whether that was taking out ads in newspapers, whether that was social media ads, uh, we partnered with community-based organizations to go uh, knock on doors and enroll them in, uh, uh, in some of our programs. So there's a portfolio of different ways that we approach it. Um, I will say that we do have one significant constraint, which is a lot of our program designs cannot exclusively say a certain customer class is only eligible for a program. So if you are, you know, enrolled in our low income rate, we cannot design a program that says, you know, this solar program is only eligible for that. However, there are a lot of tools in the toolbox, including targeted advertising, priority enrollment, and, um, you know, ensuring that we're just deploying distributed resources in a way that helps our grid, meaning not having so much solar on one part of the city, having that spread out across the city has some grid benefits as well. So there are constraints, there are very real constraints, but there's a lot of tools in our toolboxes to work against that and to encourage equity. And, and virtually every program that we've launched over the last couple of years includes um, significant um, consideration for equity to where we can, you know, uh, at, at a minimum provide priority enrollment if there are underinvested areas. 
Jason, to follow up on that uh, uh, that point, are, are the constraints um, are, are they viewed or perceived as, as legal constraints? Yeah, I'm not an expert in, in in this. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that there are state laws that uh, make it difficult uh, for cities and municipal utilities to have very specific targeted programs that would only be eligible to you know one specific customer class. Again, um, there are there are still tools on our toolbox to address it, but that's my understanding of it, and, and I don't know that it's within LADWP's power to sort of overcome that. Again, that's yeah. not an excuse to say we can't do it. We yeah. still have the obligation to figure out how to do it, and we've got a lot of tools in our toolbox to do that. No, I give you points, obviously, for the, the workaround, you know, and, and the interpretation of what may be those uh, uh, considerable constraints or barriers. And, and if you can also offline uh, at uh, your earliest convenience uh, sort of kind of give me that breakdown of what those uh, specific constraints are, uh, and, it, and perhaps my office as well as, as, as my colleagues in through our chair, you know, Mr. Farrell, we can maybe figure out, you know, ways how we can make things uh, easier for you uh, so that uh, it can be a, 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 a truly comprehensive program. We're not there as a comprehensive program by no stretch of imagination, but, you know, we want to get there. And, uh, and I thank you for that. L last question I have is, you know, through, a, you know, a numerous rate payers, um, I, I've been hearing that one of the barriers to accelerating you know, DG, you know, distributed uh, uh, generation uh, throughout the city or, or delays and the, 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 the DWP hookups. Uh, so, uh, now, again, I don't know if you know the answers right now. If you don't, that's okay. Um, and uh, if you can just get them offline, I'm perfectly happy with that too. But the question is, is what's the average wait time uh, currently for our residents who are requesting a hookup uh, to DG rooftop solar? Yeah, I don't have that um, information uh, available right now. I know that we, over the last several years, have made really incredible strides in that area, uh, but I don't have the data, and, and we can certainly include that when we do uh, report back on the uh, locations of DG. Okay, fantastic. Just a quick synthesis, you know, breakdown on zip codes, uh, important. Uh, the question with regards to the constraints, uh, so what we can do is be helpful, and if you can sort of break down uh, what that program looks like from soup to nuts, you know, uh, uh, A through Z uh, with regards to the equity issue. So it's a truly comprehensive, you know, uh, program. And then obviously the, the request wait times for the hookup uh, for DWP. And obviously that's just across the board. So it doesn't make a difference if you live in uh, a well-to-do neighborhood or a, a low-income neighborhood, just what the average time is, that that'd be good. And, and uh, if we can get that to my office, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon. Uh, and Mr. Krikorian. No? Okay. Uh, we're good. Thank you, colleagues, thank you. Uh, really great questions. And Jason and Arash, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's very exciting that we're uh, moving forward with this program. It, 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 it's already really providing uh, great results. Uh, so uh, I, I'm very excited about this, and thanks for your work on this. Uh, so, colleagues, what I'd like to do is just move to approve this item. We can get it to council, and uh, along with that, some of the points that Mr. DeLeon brought up in terms of uh, a legal briefing, essentially, uh, as to whatever constraints we might have uh, as it relates to uh, uh, some of the uh, equity issues that he brought up. Uh, that would be good information to have. So kind of... Uh, uh, city attorney Sorry. Uh, so Mr. 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 Thomas, yes. So move, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sorry. I guess we, we, take, we take a vote then. Uh, uh, to make it official. Council Member Mitchell Farrell? Aye. Council Member Mark Ridley Thomas? Aye. Council Member Paul Coretz? Aye. Council Member Kevin DeLeon? Aye. Council Member Paul Corian? Aye. Uh, the item is approved, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, I would now like us to move to the second uh, item uh, and last remaining item on the agenda. Mr. Prieto, if you could please, number two. Certainly, Mr. Mr. Chair. Item number two relates to Department of Water Power report in response to a motion, Kokorian, Bond, and Weston, relative to the development and implementation of a research partnership to create a 100% energy portfolio for the DWP. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Good morning, Chair and esteemed Council Members. My name is Rayco Kerr. I'm the Senior Assistant General Manager for the Power System. DWP is pleased to provide a status update today on the groundbreaking LA100 study. This comprehensive industry-leading study aims to identify the investments required to get to 100% clean energy. It Madam will Kerr, assess... Yes. Ms. Kerr, if you could wait just a quick moment. Uh, I just want to uh, make a few remarks and then I'd like you to oh, continue sure. with your presentation uh, very much. I just want to make some acknowledgements right. first uh, because uh, just to state that this report has been a long time coming and we're all so excited about having this landmark item before us as we transition into 100% renewable energy. Uh, and so I join with everyone here today, colleagues and beyond uh, with this goal and a relentless commitment and a sense of urgency in working with all of our partners to make this happen. I also wanna thank, uh, especially thank uh, two colleagues here on this on this committee, Councilmember Member for your dedication and authorship of the motion, uh, which challenges all of us uh, to come up with a plan to switch to 100% renewable energy and push forward the LA100 study, as well as Councilmember De Leon in authoring Senate Bill 100 while serving us in Sacramento, uh, which legally mandates that California reach 100% clean energy by 2045. Now, a lot has happened since that bill passed. We're probably looking way beyond 2045 uh, in an accelerated way. Uh, so alongside the other initiatives to ensure uh, that we live in a healthier environment well into our future. I also want to thank all the other committee members, Mr. Koretz, Mr. Ridley Thomas, for your dedication and commitment to reverse the deadly practices of energy generation pioneered during the Industrial Revolution, the climate environmentally damaging consequences in which we live with and must confront to this day. Uh, climate change is a local problem but a national and global issue. And as one of the largest cities in the nation, number two, Los Angeles has an outsized opportunity to set a global standard for clean energy and innovative climate change mitigation at the local level. The LA100 study before us today re previews viable options that can lead us to 100% renewable energy with the use of data to inform our approach to a just transition to clean energy and environmental restoration. We still need to vet the proposed options, the costs, the time frame to meet the goals outlined in the report. And let me just preface it to say, none of it will be easy. But the good news is we're more unified than ever uh, to uh, work toward these goals for a more equitable or sustainable city, which also requires a transition to a green economy, and that means jobs, lots of them. This component alone could rival all eras in our past that provide a historical context to our development as a civilization, but that's if we get it right. Uh, as someone of Native American heritage myself, it's been important to me to strengthen our relationships and partnerships with tribal communities, which have historically been overlooked, taken for granted. That's a major focus of my office. For example, we're currently working on an energy purchase agreement with the Navajo Nation, where they will transition their now shuttered coal plant into a vast 100% renewable, renewable energy farm. This will provide the city with an additional 6% of our total power, which by definition would be a quantum leap in reaching our 100% renewable energy goals. So colleagues and members of the public listening in, this is just the start of the overall, conversa overall conversation and more hearings on the subject are forthcoming. We'll, we will uh, welcome both written form and verbal comments during these hearings. Uh, it is my understanding that we have the Department of Water and Power, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Ms. Kerr, uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, have Mr. Marty Adams, who is in attendance, uh, who heads the Department of Water and Power, to also say a few words uh, before Ms. Kerr continues with her briefing. Well, certainly, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I certainly uh, appreciate uh, all the council members' uh, time here this morning. Uh, as Reiko was beginning to uh, describe uh, the study, this is the most comprehensive study ever undertaken in the U.S. on a power system and really a fine, detailed look 
at what we need to be able to move ahead to a clean energy future. And so uh, this is a roll up of a tremendous amount of data and tremendous amount of work that's gone in. Uh, you heard from the public comments, uh, some of the members of the public were, were part of the group that were involved uh, in the study over the course of the last year plus. And we really uh, owe a great debt of gratitude to the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, uh, who is the foremost authority on, on this subject matter and has really uh, been made a tremendous commitment to the city of LA in trying to help us find the right paths forward and the right options for the future. So I do appreciate the time that you've uh, given us today to present this. Uh, you're right, uh, Councilmember O'Farrell, that this is the beginning of a, of a, of a much bigger conversation. Um, there are a lot of pieces that have to fall in place to get to where we need to go in the future. And uh, part of the whole challenge will be charting that pathway to see where we are in the near term, the mid term, and the long term to get to our goals. Um, I did want to recognize one thing from the public comments that came in is that there's a lot of discussion about doing our part in the community and partnering uh, with, with the residents and the ratepayers uh, in Los Angeles. And certainly um, that's not part of this study because this study is talking about power supply, but that is another report that we would look forward to giving you because we are um, looking to ramp up our uh, our insulation program and really focus on underserved communities. Um, uh, right now, because of COVID, we have not been in people's homes, but as soon as that situation improves, uh, we look to double our efforts in people's homes to provide free insulation and other things for energy efficiency, uh, and also doing that with local workforce and ideally expanding our, our local workforce that does that work. So we are in the process of doing that, so we're ready to hit the ground running uh, and to really be uh, a, as good a partner uh, with the community and to serve them as well as we can by helping them uh, reduce their energy consumption and therefore their power bills. So that's something that we look forward to reporting on again in the future. But I'll turn it back to Reiko, but thank you so much for your time today and for recognizing the importance of this report and this effort moving forward. Marty, thank you. thank you for your remarks, and Ms. Kerr, please do continue. Thank you. So this LA100 study will assess reliability, resiliency, as you can see from recent events, especially in Texas, that is very important. The costs, infrastructure upgrades, workforce needs, and impacts to local air quality, health, environmental justice communities. Under the leadership of this committee, including uh, Councilman Krikorian introducing the motion, as well as our board, and an effort to meet the ambitious goals outlined in the Mayor's Green New Deal, as well as Council. Incredible technical and detailed work by the Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL, DWP staff, as well as de a dedicated and diverse stakeholder advisory group. In addition to the study's unprecedented technical achievements, it is also significant in its level of deep stake stakeholder engagement. Our advisory group includes environmental advocates, community-based organizations, academia, the business community, and many others that have collaboratively shaped the NREL-led study. Broader public outreach began in January and will continue in March at the conclusion of the study, and LADWP will continue to engage our board and this committee. The LA100 study assesses several scenarios that will provide valuable insights and understanding of the trade-offs and risks between environmental goals, reliability and resiliency, environmental justice and affordability, as yesterday's power system is transformed to meet our customers' expectations for the future. Among the key insights in the LA100 study is, while all roads lead to 100%, getting there can mean very different things in terms of cost, environmental impacts, environmental justice, and reliability. At the conclusion of this study, we expect that it will demonstrate that 100% renewals is achievable by our industry-leading workforce in a way that is reliable, economical, equitable, and in a way that other utilities can replicate. While we have been working diligently to complete this groundbreaking LA100 study, it takes a longer view of our transition to 100%. LA has continued to transform our power system. Recent examples include this committee's approval of the Elon Solar Plus Storage, and the Red Clouds Wind Power Purchase Agreements, as well as the local solar programs, including the Fit Plus that you just approved. 
and encouraging and supporting EV adoption. For the next steps, the insights and trade-offs will continue to be shared with the public through outreach. And at the conclusion of the study and outreach, the feedback received as well as the LA100 study itself will be incorporated into the development of our power goals. I'd just like to acknowledge a few people that were really instrumental in this. Jacqueline Cochran, who will be presenting from NREL, and all, many of her colleagues and the whole NREL team. Joan Isaacson from Kearns and West, who helped facilitate all the AG meetings, meetings including the, the virtual um, shift a year ago. Each and every stakeholder in the advisory group, the mayor, as well as council district staff members that participated in these groups. Uh, DWP staff, there were multiple, multiple disciplines from power system planning, clean grid LA, sustainability, communications, finance, and executive staff. Uh, of course, the Office of Account Public Accountability is critical in this effort, as well as our labor partners and many others that have committed literally dozens of their own hours and personal time in support of this. And so for today's presentation, I would like to introduce Jacqueline Cochran of NREL, who will be presenting this update. Thank you, Reiko. Um, and I want to echo all your thanks, so I won't spend more time with that. And thank you, Mr. Chair and council members for inviting me here. Uh, let me... Um, I have not presented actually on Google Meet, so let me let me make sure I get this right. Um, in the in the as I'm setting this up, um, uh, I want to um, also thank um, the council for starting this uh, me uh, starting this study. Okay. I am getting no ability to share. Ashkan, are you able to share? I know you have the, a copy of this. My apologies. Uh, yes, let me, let me try it once again. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Okay, let me just go ahead and start because I don't want to waste time. Um, uh, just to review the city council motions, um, we are evaluating pathways and costs to 100% renewable electricity supply while electrifying key end uses, uh, buildings and transportation and so forth, and maintaining reliability, uh, evaluating um, potential benefits, the environment and health, uh, evaluating how environmental justice communities can benefit from and be part of the solution and how might uh, local jobs in the economy change. Uh, and I also wanted to mention a, a big thanks to the public who come out um, with their comments at the start of this. This is the, it's the public that is driving um, this question of how to get to 100% renewable energy. Um, and, and I hope that um, the study can serve as useful information um, on how to get there. Um, I, Rico had mentioned um, okay. that this is ground. I'm sorry. I can't see. Right. It says uh, that I'm. Maybe it's just me. Um, Rico had mentioned that the study is groundbreaking, and I think the Texas news helps illustrate why this is the case. The, the Texas example. Um, shows that you can get one set of solutions by looking at a normal year of operations or even 10 normal years of operations. And what we are trying to do in this study is look at not just how you meet um, supply and demand with renewable energy at all times of the year, but also what about when things go wrong? How can we still be reliable? Because, of course, the last thing we want is to be the poster child of unreliable system of 100% renewable um, system. So we have spent part of the, why this study has taken so long is trying to, to get right that that reliability question because that's that gets harder and harder the closer you get to 100 percent. Getting to 90, 95 percent renewable energy, those are pretty known solutions. Um, and then getting that last bit is where uh, where we're really um, having to evaluate trade offs among different options. Uh, um, Meanwhile, um, 
um, let me just um, walk through orally the scenarios that we look at. Um, we look, uh, we have four scenarios. Uh, one is called SB 100 based off of the legislation. Uh, this is the only scenario that allows, um, that's based on retail sales rather than uh, generation. So losses on the system um, could be from any type of technology. Oh, thank you so much, Ashkan. Um, actually, go. Uh, I'm on slide seven right now. Um, and, um, and also, this is the only scenario that allows renewable electricity credits. So this scenario does allow natural gas generation as part of it. It represents um, a, a huge change from today, um, but the change that has the least amount of new investment. So if you think about a bit giant leap forward, this is, this is like, okay, what's the minimum threshold? To the right is our early in no biofuel scenario. And we heard references earlier to LA Leeds. That was a former name of that scenario. Um, early in no biofuels hits this target 10 years earlier. In fact, in our results, it, it is at 98% renewable energy in 2030. Um, but as I mentioned, that going that last step is where um, it gets challenging. Uh, this uh, doesn't allow biofuels, um, and we'll see how that affects results as, as we go forward. And then the bottom two scenarios are um, take different uh, approaches to availability of transmission, whether it's limited or, or we can build new corridors. Across, and those are fully renewable in 2045. Across uh, all of these, we look at different type, different projections of the customer. So uh, we have a moderate level of demand projection that assumes moderate growth in energy efficiency moderate growth in electrification. So for example, 30% of cars are plug-in electric by 2045 and moderate uh, demand response. The high, which seems a lot more like the path we, we might be on, is assumes much greater um, electrification. So here, 80% of um, vehicles on the road in 2045 are plug-in electric. So that doesn't count fuel cell or anything else. Uh, and this is light duty vehicles. And this also assumes uh, the best you can do on energy efficiency. So that means anytime you are um, replacing uh, an appliance or upgrading your home, you're choosing the top of market uh, energy efficiency level. And that one also has more demand response availability, uh, which, which really comes into play with the electric vehicle charging, being able to, to help shape when that charging occurs to align with, with the um, solar generation. Um, Ashkan, if you wouldn't mind skipping back to slide four, uh, I just wanted to go over um, what's coming with our report. This is a, a, nav, a visual that we're using in our report to guide through all the different components. So let me just take a moment to walk through what's in our study. As I mentioned, we start with the customer, looking at the different demand trajectories, which I just described. We also look at different um, projections for rooftop solar that's owned by the customer. So rooftop solar and storage. We look, this is based on LIDAR analysis that we look at every rooftop in the city, every building, and evaluate what potential you could have there and offset how much of uh, a resident's bills could be offset by that um, solar and, and come up with a market-based projection of, of what happens. And we, and we do see significant growth in rooftop solar. We then turn to the power system, where we start with looking at um, utility options for local solar and storage. So, uh, you know, besides rooftops, where else can we put it? You know, are there parking canopies? Are there um, industrial lots that uh, could hold um, utility scale solar? Uh, this, you know, kind of information feeds into where you could put a virtual net metering project or community solar or, or the feed-in tariff you were just discussing. Um, and we uh, include in that analysis of are there relative costs to that in terms of connecting to the distribution grid so that we can prioritize. The goal of that chapter five is to give a ranking of, of sites based on likely cost. And then, uh, then the uh, chapter six looks at the bulk investments, right? This is the, the main kind of um, uh, dollar expense, this is what you build, these are the jobs, right? What are we building to get to 100%? Um, 
um, renewable energy. And here we look at different um, pathways based on those scenarios, like do we allow more transmission or not? Um, do we allow natural gas to stay on? Do we come up with a non-biofuel alternative? And then uh, we look at the distribution grid. We know there's going to be a lot of change coming on the system in terms of the growth in customer demand um, and in uh, solar and storage. Where do we need upgrades? And then we have the greenhouse gas emissions um, because that's driving the study is what is, you know, how can we decarbonize? What can we learn from the different approaches in terms of timing of decarbonization? Uh, we look at air quality and health. So we look at um, impacts. First, we look at changes in NOx and particulate matter um, due to the, the changes that we evaluate in the study. And, and then how does that impact ozone and fine particulate matter concentrations? And then in turn, how does that affect health um, with, uh, with uh, premature deaths, asthma, cardiovascular disease, hospitalizations, asthma, ER visits. We look at environmental justice. Um, and here we're looking at it from a couple of perspectives. One is on participation where we um, acknowledge the important role of participation in all parts of, of the clean energy future and in terms of how to, um, you know, what, what the public has voiced so far in terms of their priorities. Um, what are some approaches to improve participation? And, and then also looking at uh, distributional impacts. Of, of some of the uh, results. So for example, health. Um, are the health impacts different in disadvantaged communities versus uh, non-disadvantaged communities? And then finally, we have uh, a chapter on economic impacts and the workforce um, change that will come from this. Um, so a lot there. Uh, I don't have full results to share with you today. We have them, but first I have to, um, uh, I wanna go to the advisory group so we've, we've uh, communicated the first two rows, for maybe through chapter eight with our advisory group, but the final boxes, we have not yet communicated final results. Um, so uh, we will be back and available to you um, next month um, to, to finish the story. Um, uh, Ashkan, could you please skip to uh, slide eight, please? Uh, we've had a lot happen uh, during the course of the study. Uh, Mayor Garcetti announced um, the retirement of the ones through cooling plants, um, which we've incorporated. We incorporated, and to the extent possible, the electrification targets in LA's Green New Deal that occurred last two years ago now. Um, we have uh, evaluated hotter temperatures due to climate change. That uh, was a specific request that came out from the advisory group. Um, we have uh, a qualitative assessment of impact of electrifying medium and heavy duty vehicles because we don't have that um, a quantitative component in our study. And we have also added um, a monetization to be able to come up with a value for some of the benefits that we're seeing in terms of health, greenhouse gases. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have held 14 of our 15 advisory group meetings. All our models are complete. The whole report is drafted. Uh, we are in the process of sharing um, that with our advisory group. We've shared the first half of the, of the report with them. Uh, and we will be having our next advisory group meeting soon. We have a website of results um, too. Um, so if this plays, um, I'll be pretty excited. This um, video shows some of the spatial and temporal detail that's in the modeling. And um, uh, so, for example, Marty Adams had talked about the, all the detail that's in the study, and it is very detailed. Uh, we have, we're using the high-performance computing at our lab to, to look at all this detail. So, this is zooming in to load on an August day in 2045. That was the first image, and now we're looking at just the vehicle charging loads. So, we have these, um, every end use of load, we have modeled um, bottom-up you know, to, to get a real sense of what might be changing. And then we um, stack all the loads and we, we can have a full set of um, electrical loads looking at the city. This kind of information is what feeds into our understanding, for example, of where customer solar can help meet this load, 
what are the upgrades needed to the distribution grid and so forth. Okay, next slide, please. Um, here is an example of some of our results in terms of what we need to build. Um, and the chart shows today on the left versus um, the four scenarios using the high load projections. So SB100, early no biofuels, transmission focus, and limited new transmission. Across all of these, we see wind and solar meeting the majority of energy needs. This chart is actually capacity, not generation, so it's not energy. Um, but I'll, I'll show you energy in a minute. But most of how we meet our day-to-day -day comes from wind, solar, plus the batteries. Because storage is what helps us um, get more use out of that solar and wind investment. And then um, we see a role, because of this focus on reliability, we see a role of something that can turn on within the city and stay on for several days. We are um, trying to capture the characteristic of that as agnostically as possible, but we of course have to come up with some costs associated with certain technologies. This is the area where we are looking at the most research at our laboratory of what can we do to meet this, some call it seasonal storage, um, but really it's, it's the, what is the fuel that can come on and stay reliable? And we see a lot of value in this because we look at, um, for example, risks of wildfires and taking down transmission lines. So if you lose multiple lines and we have a lot of batteries in the city that typically would rely on bringing in um, that solar from um, the Navajo site, for example, what happens to the batteries in the city when we have big transmission outages? Here, this is where we see value. These are peaking resources um, where we can turn them on and they can run for several days and manage different kinds of events. These events might not happen year to year, but we do use these to help meet those times of the year where wind and solar um, are not, you know, like that bad November week where it's cloudy for a week, the wind's not great, and uh, we, we need a, something else. We did look at options to meet that with just wind, solar, and batteries, um, but it gets to be very costly because those last hours, like if it's sunny 330 days of the year, and then there's those other 30 days, um, adding more solar and wind to meet those periods, you have to add, you know, much higher amounts of that just to meet those um, meet those hours. So that's why we see a role of a different kind of technology. Um, demand response was something that was brought up by the community. I'm fully supportive of demand response. Um, we looked at demand response from the perspective of, of within a day, so shifting the timing of things within a day. We did not look at multiple day demand response, uh, which is uh, an opportunity for further research and, and hopefully would be a great alternative. But multiple day demand response, let's just imagine now in Texas, you know, this is where you need that three, four, five day management of load. And, and that has not been commercially demonstrated yet at scale in a way that, that we could credibly say, this is how we would do that multiple day demand response. But that's, that's the missing link in terms of demand response is how do you do the multi-day stuff? Because that's what we need for the contingencies and the events that go wrong. Um, and let me go to the next slide, actually. Um, this is showing um, what these green boxes mean. So, I'm oh, sorry, can you back up? I actually just wanted that. Um, we are, you know, a lot of comments have come also about biofuels. Um, we and the study are not assuming biofuels will be here forever. We assume it, though, as an available transition fuel. Uh, in our study, we assume that by 2045, across all our scenarios, that we can have a market for hydrogen. And by hydrogen, I am meaning we actually produce hydrogen based off of solar and wind, and not from natural gas, but this is, this is green hydrogen that, self, that could be self-produced or it could be produced on a market. Now, we, again, are trying to stay agnostic as to fuel type. What we assume in the study is that to have something that you can run online, um, come online and run for several days, you could do this through 
a fuel cell, you could do this through combustion turbine. Fuel cells are a lot more expensive. Combustion turbines are there to be, you know, your last resort type of activity, not to run every day. Um, and so we are agnostic with that darker green, R-E-C-T, as to what, what is that renewable fuel. We assume that it's going to be a fuel that's produced from re a renewable electricity, but we don't say what particular type. Um, but biofuel is the only commercially available option today. And so that is why we don't allow it in that market purchase fuel in the early and no biofuels. Um, early and no biofuels instead, because there's not a market for that type of need, um, we, we build um, hydrogen infrastructure to, to produce hydrogen and store it and then, and then burn the hydrogen. Again, this is produced off of the green electricity. Um, and okay, now I'm ready for the next slide. So um, that previous slide was what you build in terms of capacity. This is what actually gets generated on a given year. And I'm, um, let's just look at uh, the right side for starters. It's 2045. And this is each color represents the different technology that's generated. Again, most of this is um, the blues and the yellows, which is the wind. Of the, of the greens. Um, the purple represents the continued natural gas that's in the SB100 scenario. Um, and then the early no biofuels has the hydrogen. Below the zero axis is the charging energy that we need for charging. Next slide, please. Um, so across all scenarios, uh, we see the role of transmission. Um, there's already plans for building transmission, so that's um, really helpful in accessing um, diversity in resources to fuel the city, as well as um, some of the lower cost resource options outside the city. Um, we build a lot of renewable energy, customer rooftop solar, storage, flexible load, and then the renewable fuel combustion turbine. Again, this is uh, switching not just the fuel types from coal and natural gas today, so biofuel or hydrogen or something else in the future. But we're also um, changing how we run these from daily today to infrequently in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, costs. Um, bulk of the costs are this growth in wind and solar and batteries. I mean, we that is, you know, we're, we're halfway there, let's say, today. And so that's a lot of energy to replace. So a lot of the costs are just are just simply adding more renewables to the system. Uh, because of the early in biofuels um, meets its target 10 years earlier, the costs of meeting that target start incurring 10 years earlier. So that's part of why we have a higher cost there. We also have a higher cost there though, because of not having a market option to a renewable fuel and building the infrastructure instead um, for hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please. And um, this is uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with combustion of fuel for power. And we have, uh, we start uh, with much higher um, greenhouse gases because of coal but, um, with Intermountain Power Plant um, going off coal soon, that drops quickly. And then the early you know, biofuels you can see drops the fastest um, because we are reaching the target 10 years earlier. Next slide, please. This is um, all sectors. So that previous slide was power sector and just combustion. This is the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions associated with, with, with um, power, as well as the fuel burning associated with buildings and uses and vehicles with gasoline. Um, here, what's um, important to note is power is what goes down quickly. And then our greenhouse gas emissions are dominated by the buildings and vehicle sectors. Um, so by uh, electrifying um, end uses in buildings, um, especially that middle row, which represents that high electrification set of scenarios, you get uh, the most reduction in greenhouse gas emissions there, um, getting cars off the road. I mean, the internal combustion engine cars. That contributes as well. Next slide, please. 
Um, let me pause there. That's a lot. I have other components too, but that's so much right now, and I want to allow time for questions. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and I just printed a copy of, of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, so we can all do that and, of course, read through it as well. Okay, um, so in the interest of time, um, I'll just ask a question, and then I'm going to defer to uh, my colleagues uh, pretty quickly here. Just, uh, the the in, in, initial question I'd like to ask um, is specific uh, for... Uh, our, our council president, who has a real concern about the valley generator station. Um, impacts and emissions from that uh, generating station uh, to the local community. Uh, and on that point, how is this, this particular study incorporated? Uh, the environmental justice principles and issues and objectives uh, in its review of uh, and scenarios really specific to the valley uh, generating station uh the valley generating station we look at um only in its contribution to the regional averages so we we do have spatial um very like two by two kilometer grid of air quality analysis um but the way we're doing the air quality analysis is not designed to capture that neighborhood impact. Now, all of it, we do have a qualitative write-up on, on how, um, at a neighborhood feel, what changes we're likely to see. Um, so we're not, um, we're not running, I mean, a lot of the scenarios don't have any natural gas. We're just using um, these combustion turbines uh, that are hydrogen-fueled um, uh, to, meet, to meet demand. They're not run as often. When you, the smokestacks would be lower, uh, they'll be state of the art in terms of NOx emissions. Um, but uh, you know, we put in our concluding chapter some next steps could be done to look at the benefits and costs at a neighborhood scale. Um, that would that would be a good next step. And then in terms of environmental justice, how it's come in, um, we look at that. Uh, this the advisory group has played one critical role in, in thinking about envi um, environmental justice in terms of the scenarios, um, uh, you know, having, for example, the, the one that's early um, represents um, uh, uh, community groups who, who want to decarbonize as quickly as possible and clean up the air. Um, we have also spent a lot of time looking at how to change the operations of these um, power plants. Like today, you'll see power plants run to provide spending reserves. Um, so they're not actually needed for energy. They're just there to, to keep the grid reliable. And so we have spent time looking at, well, what can we do with batteries? And, and not just what can we do with batteries, but how do we know the batteries will be have a charge when we need to have this? And so that's, again, where it's taken a lot of time in the study because we're getting at the engineering details trying to reduce, I mean, we are um, really trying to reduce the, the, the need for any kind of um, combustion turbine, even if it is green fuel, because of, um, there are still emissions associated with that. And I would also say um, trying to reduce the cost of early no biofuels as a scenario, knowing that um, there is a large community who wants to see this um, happen. So, for example, originally we didn't allow hydrogen in that scenario, and that's something we went to the advisory group to, to say, hey, we've got reliability risks if we lose transmission lines, if we're relying just on the wind and solar and batteries um, and, and so forth. Um, so we walked through different options there and, and decided as a group, you know, to include hydrogen as an option to help reduce the cost of that. Um, so here are some examples. We've reached out to a number of environmental justice groups directly um, to hear their concerns, and we've, you know, we've written about um, that in, in parts of our report. Thank you. Have some of those uh, environmental justice groups been from the Northeast San Fernando Valley? I don't know, actually. Okay. So you what, uh, I, I'm going to uh, advise you to give access to the call uh, over in Council District 6. Because, uh, they, they can connect you with specific groups that are going to be very interested in, in this outcome. And lastly, on this note, 
uh, uh, will these next steps as it relates to the Valley Generating Station be included in the next uh, uh, report update? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can. I can go through. I mean, it was it was just describing some of the neighborhood level analysis that could be done. Um, okay. Basically, to capture, you know, as we're thinking about how to move forward, I think one objective from the community will be clarity on what our metrics are of, you know, what's important part of the transition. You know, how can we make sure this isn't on the backs of people who are already disadvantaged? So what are the what are the types of emissions that we expect to see out of a plant? And are we meeting those? Or are we exceeding those? And and I think that that's what I'm getting at. I don't have too much more to say than that, but that's that's the essence. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, at this time, um, I'm going to defer to uh, Mr. Kikorian and Mr. De Leon, and I'll go with Mr. Kikorian because he is preparing to chair a committee in less than an hour. So, uh, Mr. De Leon, I'll, I'll go to you first, and then the mover and the maker of this initiative, uh, Mr. Kikorian, after this, before we come back, and I have a few quick final questions. Mr. De Leon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for uh, bringing this together on, on the very important report. I want to give a, a very special thank you to, to Marty Adams, you know, Who's at the helm of LADWP? I do agree with you. This is uh, indeed uh, probably the most comprehensive uh, analysis uh, in the country of any utility, whether it's an investor owned utility or a municipally owned utility, such as LADWP, with regards to how do we actually get that roadmap to 100%, not 80%. I know we can get around to 70, 75% uh, what we did SB 100. The question was, what type of innovative technologies would be creative to be that bridge that's non-carbon to 100%. So I want to thank you very much for your leadership. Uh, thank you to, to Rayco and to Jacqueline for the presentation. also want to give a very special thank you. Uh, our, our chair just uh, uh, mentioned his name, but to Paul Kokorian, because it was Mr. Kokorian's a foresight uh, to ask for this report, you know, five years ago, uh, and who we are today, you know. So I want to give him a very special uh, recognition and shout out. Uh, he's clearly, you know, aware of resiliency and what we need to do to harden our grid and what we need to do to to get to 100% clean, renewable, zero carbon energy for a large metropolitan city like Los Angeles. So thank you very much, Mr. Kokori, uh, again for your foresight, uh, uh, vision, and, and leadership. Uh, so this is a question for either Jacqueline or, or Rayco or, or, or Marty. You know, as you mentioned, you know Texas and the, the recent wildfires in, in California demonstrate clearly that our our nation's energy grid is simply not ready for climate change. As we know, we've been gorging on carbon for decades, and that has changed our weather patterns. have become very extreme weather patterns, highly unpredictable, but a lot more dangerous. And LA is no exception. Um, so. We, we're, we're obviously, we're paying the bill now for, for decades of inaction. Um, uh, the various, the plan, the various options that you present us obviously come with a very large, you know, price tag. Um, uh, we won't get into those details right now. But uh, the question I have is, can you please explain DWP's uh, ordinary expenditures to upgrade and maintain its grid? And I'm assuming that you've been making regular upgrades to the grid, uh, and if so, at what cost? Well, one thing I would say is that, that uh, for the power system, we have about a billion dollar a year capital program that goes into um, uh, the largest piece of that is the power system reliability program, which is upgrading uh, uh, the infrastructure of our grid. As you know, um, a lot of our infrastructure is underground, which makes it very difficult to get outages when you do have to, to repair them. But also when you do have an outage, it, it's a lot more difficult to find and fix than if it's an up, o, overhead structure. So we know that um, with our underground structure, you are limited um, the size and amount you can upgrade because of the size of the conduit. We have a relatively low voltage system compared to all the other major utilities. Our low voltage is 4.8 kV. If you look at Edison and some of the others, there are minimum 12 kV or 16 kV, which means they can get, you know, two to three to four times the amount of power through their lines than we can. So we, we have a very robust 
uh, program. We base our replacements on analytics and data and age and a number of factors on what areas we prioritize. Our program is deployed all over the city. We don't prioritize one area over another um, and have yards based throughout the city. Well, thank you, Rico. This is uh, uh, an issue because we have time constraints. I'd I like to very much follow up offline uh, with you and, and, and Marty and whoever Marty feels uh, uh, appropriate. There's two more questions um, before I have to skedaddle. Um, have you pros priced the, the cost savings associated with with the public health benefits of, of electrifying our, our, both our homes and, and transportation system? Uh, if, if not, I think it would serve uh, DWP well, uh, especially with the, the public as a whole. When we start making the types of investments that are absolutely critical uh, for grid resiliency and what the uh, cost is going to be, and we also, too, you juxtapose it with the gargantuan price tag of cost savings that are associated again with health benefits, people who are dying prematurely uh, because of uh, respiratory issues, because of NOx, SOX, particular matter, because of ozone. Uh, and uh, 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 so have you done that at DWP? We have some of that in the study. Some of this, okay. I'm looking for a little more robust, you know, sort of kind of answer than that. So <laughs> I, I, I'm going to make a suggestion for all of you is that that really is important because you hear a lot of the callers come in from the public with regards to that, the public health benefits and, and what that has meant for premature deaths. Uh, in a city like LA that continues to be still, even with relatively or, or vast improvements. So we have improved dramatically, but we're still the number one most polluted city in America, uh, at least for ozone, you know. Uh, and um, uh, aside from the grid, a lot of it is tailpipe, heavy-duty diesel, drainage, and so forth right there. But, you know, I, I would strongly suggest that you come up with a, 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 a more sort of robust sort of um, uh, 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 effort to really educate and communicate directly to the, the electorate as a whole. Um, last question I have is clearly in the age of climate change, resilience is, is more important than ever. And Can you describe the steps you'll, you'll take to uh, what I call the low-hanging fruit, reduce our energy load, you know, through energy efficiency, demand response, and obviously distributed generation, and how that may impact our overall dependency on out-of-state, uh, you know, uh, base and energy. Because um, I'm going to make the assumption that it is correct to assume that those efforts are, are, are being, are, are a priority over large purchases of out-of-state power that may prove unreliable in the future if there is a, a natural disaster. And another point offline is I'd like to get into hydrogen and before we make major investments on the issue of hydrogen, because I saw in slide number 11 on SV100 and on the early in no biofuels slide as well, uh, I'm looking at Right, a large assumption, and there's a large price tag as well that goes with it. Um, so as we really break this down in, in the week, uh, I don't have the time to do it completely yet, but I, I can do it right after this. I just have to chair a committee. We're really going to have to get into the weeds and, and full detail about this. You know, so the question is again: Is our demand response, our reduction in our energy load with regards to EE? And obviously, DG, uh, because I think that plays a, a huge component, if you will, uh, to get to 100% uh, clean renewable energy. Obviously, we have a big focus on DG. We do have a lot of... Uh, um, I believe it's over 50,000 solar systems installed within our service territory. That's what leads us to be number one. Um, we, like Jason alluded to earlier, we've um, implemented our thermostat program to help reduce our loads. We have very aggressive energy efficiency targets um, that prior to COVID, we were absolutely on track to hit, but have a slight detour with um, inability to get into homes, et cetera. 
So yes, it is a very big part of both the NREL study has a big part that, um, on distributed, gener uh, distributed generation as well as energy efficiency, but we also have the offset of the increased loads from transportation electrification and building electrification. So it's very important that we're able to manage those loads effectively at times which are most beneficial to our system, our capacity needs and our energy availability. Thank you. I, I muted everyone because there was so much static. So, Mr. DeLeon, have you wrapped up? Because uh, we definitely have other colleagues who have lots of questions. And uh, I'm also going to be in your committee in, in a little over half an hour. So, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. We'll see each other very soon. Again, special shout out to Mr. Kokorian. Just one last comment. Just for the future, I think we're going to have to get into the business or out of the business of powering homes and into the business of powering cars. Uh, as well as trucks, you know, for transportation as we electrify our system. Just, uh, just part of foresight and visionary thinking for the future. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Leon. And uh, uh, DWP, would you mind removing the uh, the presentation because I cannot see uh, my colleagues visually because uh, it's still up there. But uh, Corian, uh, please take it away. I can assure you, you prefer seeing the uh, presentation. Mr. Chair, thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Kokorian, uh, if you uh, are, are ready for your questions. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and given your time limitations, I'll do my best to be brief. But um, I do want to just take one step back from the detailed questions uh, and thank, first of all, uh, Marty Adams and all the men and women at DWP uh, and Dr. Cochran, uh, to you and all of your co colleagues at, at NREL, uh, for this really historic uh, step forward of, of national importance that, that's happening today. And Mr. Chairman, I, I especially want to thank you for making this one of your first priorities as chair of this committee to bring this forward uh, and to have it uh, be heard. Because this, is, uh, this has been a, a five-year journey now to get to this point since I introduced that motion long ago and um, this is a different kind of policy making than we have uh, often engaged in in City Hall um, and the tools that we now have before us because of the work of DWP and NREL will allow us to make informed decisions about all of the detailed complicated trade-offs of achieving what we all want to achieve in a way that no utility in America has ever done. And, and, and I just can't say in strong enough terms how what a game-changing opportunity uh, this is. Uh, when we started, uh, I remember going to speak to the first advisory group meeting and speaking of this in terms of, of President Kennedy's speech about uh, landing on the moon within the decade. And at the time that President Kennedy said that, he had no idea how it would get done or whether we could even develop the technologies to make it happen. But he set out the challenge, and as a result, the engineers at NASA had to get busy to make that real. And that's what this is about. It's not about us putting out the challenge. It's about you all doing the actual work of making something work uh, that uh, you know creates a a sustainable program that's um, uh, that takes into account the economics of, of the impacts on ratepayers and the impacts on the utility that ensures grid reliability um, all of the factors that uh, are going to be critical which we'll have to grapple with in this committee and in the council uh, and with continuing to in continuing to engage the public, but ultimately it takes uh, people doing the work to make that real and not just um, an ambition. So I just, I can't thank you uh, all enough for the work that you've done uh, to get us to this point. And, and of course, that would have been something that we, a path that we had started on that we might have been able to divert from or that there might have been changes. But then Senator Kevin DeLeon taking on the challenge of taking the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world 
and committing it to 100% clean energy was, again, a step forward of national importance because there was no turning back uh, once SB 100 passed. Uh, and DWP was not going to be able to change course once SB 100 passed. And the complexity that we have leading the largest municipal utility in the country pales in comparison to what it takes to change a, an entire state's uh, electric grid and renewable portfolio. So the, the challenges involved in that are almost unimaginable. So I just want to applaud uh, our new colleague, Senator, then Senator De Leon, for that vision and, and that hard work. So if I can, uh, just a couple uh, quick questions while we still have time before the chair has to, to, to go. Um, first, I, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot more discussion beyond what there already has been about which is the better pathway, how we can tweak these pathways, all of those things. But recognizing the sense of urgency of, of progress uh, in light of the comments that the public has made and in light of all of the commitments that we have, sh each of us has, has um, committed ourselves to. Are there some common features, you know, sort of no regrets steps that we need to take regardless of the pathways that ultimately we choose, um, that we can get busy on right now, uh, the steps that will be without which it would be impossible to reach 100% renewable energy goal, that we can start on right now so that we don't have to wait further before we differentiate these pathways further and develop them more. What can we get busy on right now? Has, has, have we calculated or prioritized those sorts of steps in any of this model? I would, I would say go for everything feasible that you can do, right? So uh, you, if you find cheap solar in the desert, build that. If you can build locally, build that. If you can implement the transmission plans, build that. Demand response. I mean, we're going to need it all. Uh, where the differentiation really starts to occur is is the reliability, making meeting reliability in that last bit. So you've got. So even if you wanted to accelerate this um, at a faster schedule, there's a lot we know that we're going to need, and we're just going to need all of it. So it's not a question of do we build out of the city or in the city. You're going to need both. So I would say that as a no regrets. Well, one thing I would add to that is um, to get to 100% renewable energy will clearly take a lot of um, utility scale outside the city. You're not going to get there with building renewables within the city. And to do that, that also requires a lot of transmission system upgrades. We do a 10-year transmission plan. We refresh it every year so we know the, the projects. We're working on those projects. We will continue to do that. But until those projects are online, and there's a lot of hurdles to get getting transmission done, you can get it to the city, you just can't distribute it throughout the city how you need it until you get those pro uh, projects complete. So we're working on those. We're also uh, simultaneously working on additional power purchase agreements and making sure that we have the capacity to bring in what we have. Uh, looking at storage, we know longer duration storage is going to be one of the critical factors to um, ensuring resiliency. So uh, we're moving forward. We have an um, RFI out there. We're doing local distributed generation. Um, so we're continuing to do all fronts, like Jacqueline said. We have not been just sitting back doing nothing, waiting for this report. We continue to move aggressively and uh, as quickly as we can because we recognize the urgency. Clearly. And, and again, I want to applaud DWP because even when we've set – even when back in the old days when I was a member of the state legislature, we were setting standards for uh, the RPS. DWP was always ahead of the curve, and so um, I, I appreciate that. So you mentioned transmission, <clears throat> and that's big, one of my biggest concerns because uh, clearly we're going to need substantially more transmission under any scenario just because of, of grid growth and, and demand growth. So... Um, what I would like to ask, and we don't need a comprehensive discussion now, but as we bring this back for further discussion, I'd like the committee to begin considering um, real a real plan for what 
type of transmission would be needed in each of the scenarios, uh, what type of transmission will be needed um, just because of load growth, and um, how each of the different scenarios would impact the specific transmission needs that the department will have. Because if it takes, if it still takes eight years to get a transmission line approved through environmental review and, and construction and so on, um, needless to say, that's one of the great barriers to us getting to our goals, especially if we expedite these goals, unless we start immediately. So to me, that's the, one of the key elements of this. So if you could come back next time and really talk about the specifics of your transmission needs under the scenarios, uh, that would be great. And similarly to that, um, when it comes to grid reliability within the basin, um, what sorts of distribution upgrades are going to be necessary um, and what other steps uh, need, will we need to take to ensure grid reliability as we go to a higher degree of intermittency um, and how does in-basin generation help us with that. So. I have so much more, Mr. Chairman, but I want to be sensitive to time and other members, so um, I'll pass and we'll come back uh, if there's still time. Thank you. Yeah, we can do a quick round robin. Uh, we'll go with Mr. Koretz uh, and then, and then uh, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair Ruben Thomas. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm very pleased that we're hearing this item today and uh, want to thank our colleagues, uh, Mr. Kerkorian and Mr. Bonin, for uh, uh, launching this 100% effort. Um, I also want to acknowledge and welcome our new Climate Emergency Mobilization Director, Marta Segura, who started to work on Tuesday and I know is listening in because uh, the discussion is so relevant to her. Um, I'm not sure if I'll even have time for questions, so I'll probably just make a few comments and see if I have a moment for a question or two. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is shortly after I was first elected to the Council in 2009, um, I was the first council member to sign on to the LA Beyond Coal campaign. And at the time, DWP said I was crazy and it would never happen. Never, never, never. Well, this past December, we demolished the Navajo Generating Station and uh, ended the environmental injustice that's been flick inflicted upon the Navajo and the Hopi. And uh, the IPP will be next in line. So it shows what we can accomplish when we put our mind to it. Uh, unfortunately, despite our best efforts so far, the breakdown of our climate continues unabated. We've certainly seen it with the insane cold in Texas and the failures of natural gas pipelines, uh, which of course points out another reason why natural gas is a poor choice. Um, Back in September, we uh, had the hottest days in L.A. County history at 121 degrees, uh, temperatures which we used to associate with Death Valley, not Los Angeles. Um, and those days highlight the link between global heating and health impacts and why the most polluted communities are having the worst impacts. There will be a lot of talk about the cost of going to 100% renewable being too expensive, but the cost of not doing that is already much, much worse. Um, just as an aside, I want to I want to point out that uh, for some reason DWP decided not to post the report in the original council file, which uh, contains a huge amount of public comment, especially from an, an unusually high number of neighborhood councils. So I don't want us to miss that. Uh, one neighborhood council, the West Side Neighborhood Council, called for the option to be considered to include a 2030 scenario, uh, one which excludes dirty and dangerous fuels such as methane, biomass, or unbundled renewable energy credits. And uh, I, I would ask that uh, we correct that in some way, at least having the city clerk transfer over all the letters and impact statements to the new file. Um, I would also uh, say that uh, that, that uh, the Westside Neighborhood Council made a good suggestion, and I would ask that uh, we have a report back 
uh, for the department to go and model a 2030 scenario as well, and one that excludes dirty and dangerous fuels such as methane, biomass, or unbundled renewable energy credits, but one that does include an ambitious citywide effort on energy efficiency. Um, I think that has not been uh, dealt with uh, adequately as a focus, and the least costly and most efficient uh, unit of, uh, of power is the one that we don't use. So, the, again, as, as I have for many years, uh, I think this should be our, our number one focus, should be how do we reduce the demand um, and how do we create more energy efficiency. And uh, uh, so those, those are my comments. If I could sneak in a question or two, um, one would be about energy efficiency efforts and why we didn't focus much on, uh, on that area. We, we, we do, actually. We, um, our, half our scenarios assume um, very ambitious energy efficiency. As I was um, mentioning earlier, that means um, all consumers only buy top-of-the-line efficiency. There's a lot of growth, though, just because of electrification. Okay, and uh, also, uh, uh, my understanding is that despite uh, a number of requests, we really didn't succeed in terms of engaging with the frontline and underserved communities uh, up front in terms of how we structured the 100% renewable working group. Uh, how can we do a better job of this in the future? I'll let LADWP take that. Uh, um, so so uh, when we engage um, stakeholders for this report, uh, it was um, we don't have our communications folks on the on the line. I don't think Joe Romalo. I know we worked closely with the council district's office as well as the mayor's office communications folks and ensured that we had a very broad range of stakeholders that were engaged in this process. And um, as part of that, there were um, um, Pacoima Beautiful. That's part of the Repower LA. Um, that's part of the advisory group. Um, so there are community-based organizations that are also included. And I'm not sure if Jason or someone else on the call has more detail or information on that. Yeah, I'll just quickly add that the advisory group, including community-based organizations, environmental organizations, and folks all across the city have been involved from day one. Um, we've had opportunities to have folks um, also observe, uh, and uh, many folks played a significant role in the creation of the advisory group, and I think from that perspective, a study like this under its development has an unprecedented level of engagement uh, through the development of it. Uh, I will say that we are always looking for ways to improve our outreach, and we started that process uh, last month, and we are absolutely open uh, to um, broadening that, and we always look for feedback and we have an opportunity to do that um, in March uh, at the conclusion of the study. And that does not mean, once the study is done, that there's no opportunity to influence the, the direction of LADWP's power plan. There absolutely is. And we do that on an ongoing basis every year as part of our power plan. So uh, if, there, if there are areas for improvement, we are all for it, and, and we'll take that feedback very, very seriously. Uh, can, I, can I squeeze in one last question? And hopefully, hopefully, yeah, before you do, one second. Before you do, um, this is going to come back for a final report, and I'll make sure and schedule it at a time where we can have a robust, uh, et cetera. So squeeze one quick one in because i got to get to Mr. Ridley-Thomas. I'll squeeze in a quick question. I won't even ask for an answer now. I'll ask for an answer at a later time. But uh, I'm just wondering whether we're expecting any significant level of state and federal incentives to help us with this effort since we're a city of 4 million people trying to transition to 100% renewable energy and whether we get benefits from CARB and AQMD um, and other sources uh, to help us or whether we're 
uh, just in on, on this uh, alone. So I wouldn't ask for an answer now, but maybe the next time. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for everything that you've done to help make this happen and a great discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chris. Mr. Ridley Thomas. Chair, Mr. Corian, uh, and all those who are responsible for bringing this before us, um, we just had a display on the part of Mr. Tourette's, Mr. Chair, what a skilled legislator does. He'll say that I'll make this brief opening remarks and maybe uh, ask a, uh, a question or two, but uh, figures out how to get five questions in and, and bootstraps it over to the next session. Let's give Mr. Tourette's a big round of applause. A skill, though he may be. Well, what is this about, Mr. Chair, really? I think it's about a carbon-free future. I think it's about public health. I think it's about environmental justice. I think, finally, it is about reimagining a workforce development and all of what uh, that uh, might uh, portend uh, for uh, our futures and the future of generations yet unborn. And so it seems to me this is momentous. This is noteworthy by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, shout out to DWP, to partners, to the consultants, uh, to the staff, uh, more broadly speaking, for bringing us up to this point. And I think it suggests that if we just endure, if we just persist, good things can indeed happen. happen. So with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, I'll uh, yield and uh, look forward to the next uh, uh, conversation where we can dig in even more deeply. I thank you. That is a great way to wrap up this initial conversation. I really appreciate that. That was the intent. That was the intent. It's called so the well. benediction. <laughs> you know, uh, I love your um, intentiveness. Let me just say that. Hey, uh, quick, quick. We haven't heard from our rate payer advocate today. And I know Camden Collins has been standing by. So just real quickly, Ms. Collins, or yes, uh, in terms of um, your participation uh, as a stakeholder in the LA100 study, your general observations, if you could weigh in. Yes, this is Camden Collins for the Office of Public Accountability. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. I've got a slightly unstable video, so I've got that turned off for you. Um, you know, this is just a leading edge group, and I, I would be remiss if I failed to mention that we've really seen DWP grow in our partnership with NREL, and we think that that provides a foundation for what's going to transpire next. We've also seen DWP grow in our ability to manage such a large stakeholder group. And if you think about that carefully, it, it forces them to stretch in two opposite directions. They have to stretch to become more te technically adept at receiving increasingly detailed analysis and stretch in the other direction and try to communicate it to the community and involve them in getting their input. And we saw them many times frame issues and bring it to the advisory group and take input and really listen to the group in a balanced way. So we're very excited to see what they say next and how the costs look. And we'll be coming back to you with our analysis when the report is out and the rate analysis is a little bit more ripe. Thank you, Ms. Collins. I don't want to uh, undervalue uh, the, the, uh, the job and the mission of a rate payer advocate uh, because when we talk about just transition uh, to renewable energy, uh, this is where the rate payer advocate really, really comes in. So we have an all-in approach uh, to eliminating carbon emissions and uh, this is a first significant step forward to help guide us uh, through, through this uh, process. Uh, and so I, th I want to thank everyone uh, for your participation. Uh, it is my understanding that we will go ahead and uh, uh, continue this matter in committee. Uh, and I will report regularly on the progress of this report. I think that uh, there, there's lots of feedback that has been offered and lots to work on for the final report. Mr. Chris, did you have one last comment? Yeah, I just wanted to be sure that uh, we included my request that uh, we get a report back on the possibility of modeling a clean 2030 scenario, 
which would go further than uh, the other scenarios that are already included. But uh, according to virtually every scientist that's looked at this issue, uh, beyond 2030, we are likely to miss the boat. Thank you. I see no reason why we can't have a, a thesis on what it, that would require, 2030. Uh, and uh, so I, I support that uh, within the final report. Thank you. All right. Uh, unless there is uh, no objection, that will be the order. We, this is continued in committee. And Mr. Villanueva, do we have uh, any other business before this committee? The desk is clear, sir. Thank you. Again, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Cochran. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Thank you, Marty, uh, for uh, all of your great work and that, and that of your colleagues, Ms. Yancey included. Uh, really terrific work. Thank you all. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You bet.